Growing up in Axe, I lived next door to my Granny Kite. And any time I walked over to her house, I always went in through the back door. She even had a little sign above, beside the door that said, back door guest or best. And underneath that little sign was where she had the spare key in case she ever locked herself out or you need to get in in case she wasn't there. And as far as I remember, that back door was always open. There was a screen door there, of course, but it was always unlatched. And whenever I walked over, I would knock on that screen door, and I would always hear her say, Doors open. Come on in. An open door is an image that's inviting and that's welcoming. So it's not surprising then that one of the last images given to us in the Bible is a beautiful picture of Jesus standing and knocking outside a closed door, wanting desperately for someone to open the door and let him in. Let's look at Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse 20. Jesus says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus knocks, but He knocks gently. Sometimes we wish He wasn't so meek and mild and gentle. Sometimes we wish Jesus was more like that farmer who in a desperate attempt to get the mule to do what he wanted, knocked him upside the head with a two-by-four, telling all the people who saw him do it that he just wanted to get the mule's attention. I was playing around on YouTube this week, and I ran across an old, old country song by Bobby Bear, Dropkick Me Jesus. The full title is Dropkick Me Jesus, through the goalpost of life. What a thought. Drop kick me, Jesus. Don't give me any chance to go this way or that. Just drop kick me straight on back. Sometimes, that's what we want. We want Jesus to step in, to take over, take charge, and make everything easy, simple, perfect. Maybe, without even realizing it, we sometimes want a God who will take away all our options and treat us like little children. Behave, or I'll whip you. Sometimes, we want a God like a trainer on The Biggest Loser that will get in our face, make us shape up, and tell us what to do because it's the good thing for us. Instead, We have a courteous Christ who knocks ever so gently on our heart's door. He's not going to break into our souls. He's not going to hack into our hearts. He stands and he waits and he knocks. And he knocks so softly at our heart's door that we can ignore him if we choose to. Have you ever seen the painting, The Light of the World, by Holman Hunt? It's the famous painting of Jesus standing outside a door, knocking. Find a copy and really look at it. And when you do, you'll see that there's no latch on the outside of that door. Jesus knocks. You see the compassion in his face. You see the longing in his eyes. But there's no way 
He can open the door from the outside. So don't be afraid. We're not in any danger of some kind of divine breakout. Instead, He knows and we know that the latch is always on the inside. The latch to the door of our heart is on the inside. If we're going to let Him in, we have to do it. Do you remember when Elijah hid in the cave on the side of the mountain? God said, stand upon the mount before the Lord. And Elijah looked and saw a wind that smashed the rocks to pieces. But God was not in that wind. He saw an earthquake that rearranged the face of the earth. But God was not in the earthquake. He saw a fire which was devastating. It consumed everything that was before it. But God was not in the fire. After the fire, the Bible tells us there was a still, small voice. And God was in that quiet voice. So it's not surprising that the Bible says, if you would know, be still. Be still. Because this Christ is so courteous, he knocks very gently. See him in Luke 24 as he joins two disciples who are walking to the little village of Emmaus. Those two disciples are still heartbroken after the cross, thinking that the one they had hoped in is gone. And those disciples are blinded by their tears and their disappointment And they don't recognize when Jesus shows up and walks with them for seven miles. And they tell him about everything that has happened to him. And then when they reach their little hometown, the disciples turn to go home. And the Bible tells us Jesus walked ahead as if he were going on. He was about to go further down the road. But they stopped him, inviting him to come in. See this. He would not invite himself in. He waited for the invitation to come from them. So maybe you're wondering, how long will Jesus wait? Will he ever give up on me? Will he ever give up on my friends? Will he ever give up on my family? How long does Jesus wait? Jesus knocks. He knocks gently. But Jesus continues to knock. He keeps on knocking. He just as he taught his disciples to seek and knock and ask, he keeps on seeking and knocking and asking. He never gives up on us. Never. When the Bible talks about God's everlasting love, it says, Can a woman forget her nursing child? The Bible implies that a mother cannot forget her child. But even if she could, I will not forget you, God says. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Listen, as he speaks to the prophet, How can I give you up? That He sees us in all of our brokenness, all of our despair, all of our depression. He sees how quick we are to judge someone, how quick we are to lie and try to cover things up. He sees us in all of our sin and our brokenness, and He still says, How can I give you up? My heart recalls within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. Even though we've sinned against Him and we've been selfish and we've been disobedient and we've done what we've wanted to do, He still asks, How can I give you up? 
how can I ever stop loving you? He's overwhelmed by compassion. Do you remember Hosea? Do you remember how Hosea chose Gomer? A prostitute, a woman of the street for his wife. He gave her a position in the community. He gave her his name. He gave her respect. He gave her love, loyalty, devotion. And do you remember how she became the mother of his children? And then, then she returned to her old life. And this time she went so low and stayed so long in her prostitution, her sin, her harlotry that he was able to go and finally buy her back. And God said, Hosea, I've done that over and over again. My people never get so low that I don't want them back again. I can never give them up. You see, every lost soul is a defeat for our God. A personal defeat for Jesus Christ who bled on a cross that no one might be lost and that everyone might be saved. Bill Henson, my favorite preacher, told a story about Walton White who was 91 when he went to the hospital. He called Henson one morning his voice full of excitement. So Henson rushed to the hospital and he asked, Mr. White, what's going on? He said, I want to tell you about a dream I had. I dreamed I was walking down the road. I came to a fork in the road and there was a man standing there. I think he had to be Jesus. And when I got to the fork, And I didn't know which way to go. He said, Walton, you go to the right. So I went to the right. And when I went that way, I found the most wonderful people I've ever met in my life. It was like Christmas and homecoming, all wrapped up and blown up ten times. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. I know that was heaven. And then he said, but a strange thing happened. After he sent me to the right, he went to the left. Can you tell me anything about my dream? So Henson responded by saying, Mr. White, what do you think it means? And then he said, I think it means... I'm about to die. And God's giving me some reassurance. Henson said, that may, that may be. And then he said, but the strange thing that puzzles me is that after Jesus sent me to the right, he went to the left. And Henson said, Mr. White, I believe our Lord is the kind of Christ who doesn't just stand at the gates of heaven as a receiving committee. But he runs a rescue shop outside the gates of hell. He stations himself across the gates of destruction so that if anyone is going inside, they have to crawl over his outstretched body with their muddy boots. Mr. White thought for a moment and then he smiled and said, that would be just like Jesus, wouldn't it? That's the kind of Jesus that we have. So does that mean that you can wait as long as you want to repent of your sins and become a Christian? Does that mean that you can live as you please, take personal freedom irresponsibly, and interpret freedom to mean the right to do whatever? You won't? Can you just follow your own selfish desires for 40, 
60, 80, 90 years, and then finally come at the last to repent of your sins and still be given a place in heaven? That's exactly what it means. I believe you can capitalize on the compassion of Christ. That you can put off your commitment to the last possible moment. If you know when that is. And if your commitment and your repentance is genuine and sincere, even at the 11th hour, you'll still be given a place in heaven. It's like all those laborers who sat around the town square all day long. You can wait until the 11th hour to go into the Lord's vineyard. And when payday comes, you'll still get the same pay as everybody else. That same reward. But we need to see that those people who came in the 11th hour missed the greater glory. Because the greatest glory was to be in that vineyard all day long. That's where you can find the roots of joy. The knowledge that you stood shoulder to shoulder with Jesus. That you gave Him the strength of your youth. That you offered yourself to Him when you had a lot to give. That you were a co-laborer with Christ. He's closer to you than you realize. He's the one knocking on the door to your heart. Have you ever listened? Perhaps the greatest danger comes from the fact that He does knock gently. There may come a time, although He keeps on knocking, There may come a time when we become so insensitive that we no longer hear it. That we become accustomed to hearing that sound. The sound of Jesus knocking that sounds so dramatic at first that if we ignore it, it can be absorbed by all the noise in our day-to-day lives. Do you remember when Paul was writing to Titus? He said, some people have seared their conscience. They've known what was right, but they've done wrong, and they've set up such a conflict that their conscience have been seared, and they're no longer responsive. It was like Felix, who after hearing Paul preach, was moved by his message, but he said, Go away for the present. When I have an opportunity, I'll send for you. Two years later, Paul was still waiting in jail. So is it any wonder then that the early church was always saying, Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is a day of salvation. Do it now. They were saying and urging us. Because our souls are like springs. How much flex is in them? How much responsiveness is in them? Because that which we feel so strongly now, how can we be sure if we continue to ignore and delay that it will still be there? We can't know that. We can't presume concerning a matter of eternity. We must be responsive now. Do you remember the story Jesus told about the ten maidens? Five of them were foolish. They were always going to trim their lamps and going to fill them with oil another day. They would have reasoned like this. We'll always have another Sunday. We'll always hear another sermon like that. We'll hear this again. There's always going to be another chance for me. 
And then the Bible tells us, in the middle of a dark night, the bridegroom came when he was least expected. And oddly enough, the door that had been opened so long was finally shut. All of those years, there had been an open door. And finally, dreadfully, the door was shut. Sometimes, Jesus stands outside the door of our hearts and He knocks. And He knocks. And He continues to knock. And He knocks until He knocks with bloody knuckles. Remember what the writer of Hebrews said. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. If you hear Jesus knocking, come and pray. Our altar is always open. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.